All right, so I followed up on Hawk Nelson and this talking about another video on these celebrity deconversions or <laughs> yeah, celebrities. Celebrities kind of a stretch, Craig. Yeah, okay, gotcha. And <laughs> these these who who on earth are these guys deconversions? Um, minor celebrity deconversions, like yes. Yeah, so so you, what is it? Uh, you know, Dancing with the Stars deconversion. So who's that? I don't know. Someone Dancing with the Stars. And you never heard of the guy. Okay, so I, I listened to, I, I read the guy from Hawk Nelson's Instagram post. And let me just say right off the bat, I know I said it before, but it's totally, it's of a different order than Brett and Link from Ear Biscuits. Now, I said this already, but I go, I'll just reiterate. Brett and Link I really objected to. And I did a whole video where I kind of tirated on them, and I do it again in a heartbeat. Why? Because I really don't like those guys, to be perfectly honest with you. His, his deconversion was a totally different thing. It was a, one Instagram post, and it was a lot more matter-of-fact. He didn't do what they did, put up an hour-and-a-half-long video of their emotional hand-wringing and their intellectual hand-wringing and look at how much we've really dug into our souls to present to you how much soul-searching we've done. We can't stress this. And I found them so shallow and so fake and so disingenuous. Honestly, I found them morally vacuous. I found them intellectually vacuous. I found them to be shallow, vapid narcissists who didn't want to admit that to themselves, so they put, you know, pretended that they went through all these groundbreaking struggles that I just didn't find real at all. Now, I do not think the same thing about Hawk Nelson. My credit with him is, with at least basic integrity. Again, his Instagram post, you can go read it. It's not hard to find. It's a lot more matter of fact. What I got from it, the subtext is, I'm just not feeling it anymore, guys. Really, honestly, I'm just not feeling it. Now, I put out a video on it already, but I want to go into it again because I think there's a lot here that can be addressed. The part about it that is a little weird. Well, first, let me say right off the bat, okay, Hawk Nelson. I, I don't, don't know their music. I can't imagine that that could be a good band. That's such a lame name. It sounds so wimpy to me. I mean, am I, is it just me, Hawk Nelson? It sounds, it sounds so weak and so wimpy. And apparently they're a punk band. Now, I didn't research the band. I haven't listened to the music yet, so maybe I got another video coming out where I listen to the music, and maybe maybe they're good. I just don't see how that's possible. I mean, that name doesn't sound punk at all. <laughs> it sounds like it, the first thing it reminded me of when I was in second grade. This is no joke, a true story. I had this little kind of boombox tape recorder that I was really proud of, and I was listening to YMCA. YMCA. It's fun to stay at the. <laughs> I swear to God, this is a true story, and I was uh. Young man, there's no need to feel down, I said, young man. <laughs> and I was like really proud of myself and I anointed my friends at the time a, 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 street, a street gang. I was like, we're, we're, we're like a gang, guys. We're the Falcons, man. We're the Falcons, man. And that's what the name sounds like to me. Like a wimpy little second grader's idea of like tough. Hawk Nelson. We're going to be Hawk Nelson, guys. Yeah, high five. That's so badass. And it's, it just sounds so wimpy to me. I can't imagine that it's a good band, especially as the name of a punk band. You know, a punk band is supposed to be shocking, even to, especially to, a, I guess, a Christian. All right, never mind. Just a little aside, whatever. I'll listen to the music. I can't imagine that they're good. I just don't see how they could possibly be good, but I'll give them a fair here. But outside of that, his deconversion is a lot more matter-of-fact. But there's Stephen in his matter-of-fact deconversion, okay? And I talked about this already, but he, there was the part where he was 20 years old. And he's still a member of the church. And he starts feeling like, you know, a lot of these people are just cheerleading for Jesus. And he started de deconverting, disconnecting then. Then it wasn't deconverting, it was disconnecting. Why? Because he wasn't really feeling it then. And I really honestly wish he had spoken up then. And if you're a Christian now and you're 20 years old and there are things going on in your church, speak up now. Why? It's healthier. Even if it caught ruffles feathers, if you're entertaining doubts now, don't let them fester inside of you. You don't have to wait until you're Pine Creek Doug. <laughs> I'm Pine Creek Doug now, Craig. You know, I'm, I don't believe in God. I'm going to be evangelical atheist from now until the day I die. He kind of waited. You know, yeah, it starts with doubts. Some of those doubts are pretty normal, pretty par for the course in terms of a Christian walk. Some of those disconnects are pretty normal. And it'd be a lot healthier if Christians just spoke up. 
right then and there. Yeah, some, some church people are going to get mad at you, but whatever. And depending on the church, some of them may kick you out. <laughs> All right, you know, I'm sorry you feel that way, get out. <laughs> go, go, go be an atheist. You know, some of them might kick you out, but it's better to experience that then and deal with your doubts head on as they occur. I just think that's so much healthier than let them fester inside of you until you become Pine Creek Doug one day down the line. Because that's, you know, left unaddressed, that will happen. Now, the other part about it that's a little bit strange and in this, he is not unusual. So I, I, I like him more than Bretton Link. I think he's more of a real person. And his, his deconversion struck me as a lot more matter of fact, a lot more honest. And there was a lot more integrity. But there's still anomalies in it. There's still some things that are pretty weird that he doesn't notice. And most people reading it won't notice. But I started to think about it over the last two days. I'm like, you know, that's, that's a really interesting thing to note. He talks about... By the time he says in the last two years, three years of his what life, him and his wife just haven't been feeling it, haven't go to church. He acts like this is something like the weather. And almost everyone who is deconverted has some variation on this. They act like it's something like the weather, something that just sort of happened to them. Oh, it was raining on me the whole time. Like they have no agency over it and they have no, there's no choices that they make. A religious walk is not a something that doesn't require you. It's not something that just happens to you irrespective of what you bring to the table. That's what a lot of atheists act like. Oh, if God showed up then and there, I'd believe it. And they even go so far as to say belief is not a choice. That's a common myth in the atheist communities. Oh, yes, it is. There's a lot of agency involved in the things that you believe. They aren't just like the weather. It's not just raining out, therefore I see it's raining. That's not how most beliefs work. Rare are the beliefs that work that way. That's kind of what you mean. Is it raining out? Yes. Why? Because I see the rain and I'm getting wet. That's how you act all beliefs are. That's not how most beliefs work, especially the deeply held beliefs. By your same logic, a flat earther is perfectly legitimate. To, to believe the earth is flat. Why? He's got no choice in the matter. I can't help what I believe. Yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah, you can. You have agency over the things you believe. You have agency over the things you investigate. The investigation process is what leads you to think this thing is true and that thing is true. There is agency every single solitary step of the way. And with the religious experience, even more so. Why? Because a religious experience is partially subjective. Even in the best case scenario, there is a fire that we talk about in the Christian community, that we're Christian community, and we mean something by it when we say somebody's on fire of the Lord, okay? And that is partially a choice. That is partially you are bringing something to the table and you are consciously cultivating something ahead of the curve, ahead of other people. It's not something that just happens to people. It may start out feeling that way, but even that is subjective. That's why I talk about the first time I became a Christian, and I say I had a really powerful experience. Obviously, there are some things about me that were different that made that experience able to occur. First of all, I was open-minded to it, and I was completely available to it. And then I was like that with everything. If there was something there to be tried, something there to be experienced, I was in. I would put my skin in the game and I would try. That's why I tried being a deadhead, tried being a punk. I did it all. You know, I didn't try being, but I did the, I did the deadhead thing the way a deadhead do. Took, took, you know, took drugs, and psychedelics, and went to the dead show and danced in the field just like a deadhead. I gave it the, gave it the whole college try. I was in to try it. If this is the thing, I'm going to do it the way they say to do it. When in Rome, do as the Romans. Got to do the same thing with the religious experience. It's partially subjective. If you bring none of yourself to the table, you will find nothing there. Bang, just like that. And that guy acts like it was entirely up to, out to outside forces. Like he had no agency over his Christian walk. No agency over his religious experience. A lot of atheists talk about this. Same people who tell you I was this really, really committed Christian once upon a time. Okay, but then you start beginning a process of deconversion. You didn't just begin a process of questioning, you began a process of deconversion. And there are things that the Bible tells, if you're a person struggling now, there are things that the Bible tells you clearly to do. 
Don't wait 15 years from now and say, I was a real Christian. A real Christian right now who's struggling does things to make that struggle a lot easier. Starts praying more, starts worshiping more, starts trying to passionately re reconnect and kindle the fire. There is choice and agency involved in that, period. Period. There was 10 years ago when you deconverted to. You made decisions. Again, think of the flat earther. Think of the flat earther. If you don't think beliefs are choice, then what's, what's his deal? He's got no agency. He's got no agency. Beliefs aren't a choice. That's the same logic. That logic would apply to him too. He's got no choice over what he believes. He is choosing to see some things and, and down discredit other things. That's how all beliefs work like that. All beliefs work like that. And they are heavily tethered to your emotions. There's the logical predicate for your beliefs. And atheists will insist up and down that that's the whole story. That's a very small part of what you actually really believe and care about. And then there's the emotional resonance of your belief. And I honestly think that's the whole ball game. That's why I keep saying some of this is politics, some of this is politics, some of this is politics. Because the emotional resonance of the things you believe is really where the game is played. It's really what happens. And that's really what he's talking about underneath it all. The fire went out and I just didn't care. That's it. That's what he said. I don't, cre I don't disbelieve him. And I credit with him integrity. But that's part of what he's saying. The fire went out. And he's saying something that just happened to me. I had no agency in it, and I'm not sure I care. Now, though, if we are the Christian community to hear him correctly, the thing that he's saying is, make me care. Make me understand that I do care. He's not saying, give me the arguments. Why, the arguments aren't really the thing. They're not really the thing. That's what the atheist convinced, convinced us is the real thing and maybe convinced themselves. Maybe they buy it, but it's not the thing. The idea that, that he, he even brought up, to, brought up, you know, there was the uh, cognitive dissonance of the Old Testament. Nah. T again, same, same thing I'll say a hundred times over. By the time you start looking through the esoteric parts of the Old Testament to, you know, to find out that the scriptures say that, you have one foot out the door and you are trying to help yourself deconvert. That's why you're doing it. You can start reading the Bible holistically and you can start reading the Bible in a way that's a hundred times more palatable to you. And it's a really easy thing to do. You start with Jesus. You start with the Sermon on the Mount. You start with things that you're going to easily understand, swallow and be like, yeah, amen, that's cool. Yeah, amen, that's what the, what the annotated skeptic Bible calls the good stuff. You could do a whole reading of the Bible where you stick to just the good stuff. You could go to the Annotated Skeptic Bible and just click on good stuff <laughs> and just read those. Honestly, there's a whole way of reading the Bible where you aren't challenging yourself to deconvert more. It's not, it's not real. It's not really what's going on. I, I, I get that some of you think it's the real thing. And I, trust me, it's not. <laughs> just trust me. If you don't believe me, you know... Really think more clearly about the subject. Why? Because that's not how people are wired, guys. It's not what people actually care about. It's not what he actually cared about either. What started happening is he stopped caring about church. He stopped caring about cultivating his spiritual walk. And he acted like that was something, thought was forces visited upon him outside of his control, outside of his agency. It's not. It's not. That's the point. It's not at all. It's not even close. So, where am I going with all this? Uh, doing what I normally do, just ranting a raving video. <laughs> just ranting, I'm not really going anywhere in particular. First of all, point number one, Hawk Nelson is a weak-ass name for a band. I can't imagine in any circumstances that that could be a good band. That's point number one. Point number two, he's not a vapid, shallow narcissist a la Bretton Link. I don't com I'm not completely revolted by him. <laughs> I'm really not. <laughs> Go watch, listen to my Brett and Link video. Completely and utterly revolted by those two. Found them to be vapid, shallow narcissists, don't believe a word of anything that came out of his mouth. I believe this guy. But the part about it that still doesn't quite compute is he is talking about a religious experience as if it had no is he as if he has no agency in it whatsoever. A Christian walk as if it's not up to him at all. And it is. There's tons of agency involved. That's the point. So, 
If you are 23 years old and you're starting to struggle with doubts, speak up. Don't wait till you're Pine Creek Doug. Speak up. Doubts are healthy. Doubts are, doubts are normal. It's part and part. If you're married to somebody, you love your wife, right? You had doubts about her character. There's dissonance in your relationship with your wife, right? Supposed to be. Why? It's human. It's part and parcel of everything. The Bible doesn't tell you otherwise. Doesn't tell you this is a smooth path to glory and everything's going to be hunky dory. And once you sell out to Jesus, that's it. No more, no more sorrow, no more troubles. Hallelujah. Doesn't tell you anything other than that. And what he was experiencing at 20 years old is Christians pretending kind of that it does. So they're not being authentic to what they're actually experiencing. They're trying to cheerlead for Jesus. And he's recognizing a disconnect between what they are reported to experience and what they're actually experiencing. Just because it's really there doesn't mean that's everybody in the church. Promise. I promise. But he should have spoke. One, he should have spoken up then and there why it's healthier. And yeah, there's a pretty good chance that they're going to kick you out. So what? So be it. Leave the, those, those group of po poser Christians in the dust. Go find real man Christians on Twitter. <laughs> you know, we're not, go, you know, go hang out with tribologists. <laughs> tribologists will steal you right. And Jay from England. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was funny. All right, anyways. Um, so th that's some of the points I'm making. You know, I'll go over this again in, vi in videos to come because this, this celebrity deconversion thing is something, you know, it's a real thing. But this guy had some agency involved. If you're a Christian struggling right now, the Bible tells you the way to cure the doubts. And it isn't delve into the intellectual arguments that answer the Old Testament. Go look up the scholarship. That's what that's what Pine Creek Doug had made. No one had, you know, I'll, I'll deal with his video maybe because he had no, you know, he had, was totally enjoying himself with all the things that Christians were saying in the chat, all the hand wringing. I wish he had just read, you know, <laughs> I wish he had just read Lee Strobel. I wish he had just read, you know, whoever. Uh, C.S. Lewis. The questions aren't real, guys. Some of them are unanswerable. Problem evil is one of the ones he said that's unanswerable. It's unanswerable. If, the, if it's really struggling with you, there's something else going on. There's something disconnected in your Christian walk that's making that struggle more real, more palpably real, like it's agonizing to you. There's something that's called an existential crisis, and it isn't because that, that you know, that's something that happens when you're 25, 26 years old. You start getting these philosophical things that can nag at you and kind of drive you mad. But actually, a, a healthy Christian walk helps you heal that. It's not, it's not necessarily a good thing. Yes, there's some of it is good up to a point, philosophical questioning, things like that. But it's not like you're going to actually click on an answer to the problem of evil. You're going to click on, like, you know, William Lane Craig. and Oh, now I get it. Now I understand why evil exists. It doesn't work like that. It's not how wisdom is born in a human being. You reconcile yourself to an imperfect world. Part of being a spiritual person and developing a real spiritual walk is recognizing the imperfections and the evils and the sorrows of this world as it stands so that you may, may be delivered from this present evil world. That's the promise of the Bible. Not that you're going to have all, your, all, your, all the evils going to be ironed out of your life. That God is going to help you overcome it and help you deal with it and help you have peace about it. And if you do it right, I promise you, it's all, that, that's 100% true. That promise becomes a tangible reality in your life. I can't tell you the last time I've agonized over anything for real. I honestly can't. It may have been four years where I've had any type of real, like, crisis in my life where I've struggled with something for real. Maybe, maybe 10 years. I can't tell you the last time it happened. That's, the pro that's what the Bible promises. In this world, you will have difficulty. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I will give you the tools to do it. That's what it actually says to the practicing Christian. Keep practicing Christianity, and I, Jesus, will give you peace. Peace do I give to you. Not like the world gives. It's what it promises. It doesn't promise it's going give, to give you all the answers to the questions of evil. Why, why does God allow evil and suffering? Yeah, we try to take philosophical, we try and argue it as Christians, as apologists, sure. But this is something different. He's talking about in his real life, like it got in the way of his actual Christian walk. 
shouldn't be you shouldn't be allowing that to happen. That's something you are allowing to happen. You are reconciling yourself to a dangerous and difficult world, and Christianity has given you some of the tools to overcome it successfully, to live successfully with pure peace of mind. Now, I promise you that's true, and I promise you that's the actual promise of the Bible. Not that you're going to know everything about everything. It's not, it's, not, it's not in the cards, guys. It's not what it says is going to happen. So the idea that you can be a practicing Christian and have questions about life is part and parcel of what the Bible says will be and should be. And you're going to wrestle with God to a certain degree. That's part and parcel of a real relationship. The Bible doesn't tell you otherwise. So, I'm not exactly sure what he thought. You know, maybe the only fault of him is that he listened to what he thought Christianity was supposed to be. Kind of like you think romantic love is going to be something. Then you get married and find out, wait, marriage is totally different from what I was told. Marriage is totally different from what they tell you it is, guys. Promise. <laughs> it's a lot harder, but it's also a lot more real. Why? Because it's actually real. And when you learn to love somebody real in your marriage, it's absolutely awesome. Same idea in religion. It's, it's not asking you to buy a set of propositions. It's asking you to challenge yourself, grow spiritually, become something better than you were. And in that spiritual growth, be, find Christ-likeness. Become something. That's what the promise of Christianity is. It's not a set of propositions that we're, we're, you're, gonna, you're supposed to know this stuff. And I don't know why he thinks it should have been that way. But it's not. It's not, what the, it's not what the Bible's telling you it is. It's a path. It's a path to you becoming something that is ultimately Christ-like. Those who lay down their life for me will find it. That's what, the, that's what Christianity is all about. But, you know, I know I'm rambling. You're rambling again, Craig. So, <laughs> sounds, weak. sounds lame, Craig. Doesn't sound any lamer than Hawk Nelson, I promise. That's like the weakest name I've ever heard of any band ever. That's like the wimpiest rock name I've ever heard. That's what, It's really wimpy. Does that honestly sound like, oh, man, i got to check that out. Hawk Nelson. <laughs> sounds so wimpy. So, I don't know. I can't, I can't imagine that they're good, you know. So, fuck, I mean, the guy, the guy acts like he had, that, that his deconversion process, a lot of atheists talk about this stuff, like it's the weather, it's something that just happened to them, and they had nothing, nothing to do with it. <laughs> None of their choices had anything to do with it. Ah, oh, the fire just went out, and that's that. Doesn't work like that, guys. It doesn't. It's not how Christianity works. There's a fire in Christianity that maybe you were given at one point in your life or another as a gift. And after that point, it's up to you to cultivate. Bang! Oh, yeah! So, yeah, you were a real Christian once upon a time. And after that, it's up to you to cultivate. The gift doesn't just keep giving. If you stop recognizing that it's a gift and you start disrespecting it and start going, well, these guys are smarter and cooler than my Christian friends, which is a big part of it, these guys seem to really know what time it is. These atheists are so awesome and impressive. Yeah, it sounds embarrassing and ridiculous, but that's kind of what happened. These atheists really know what time it is. Richard Dawkins makes a lot of sense. He must really know what life is all about. Yeah, that's kind of what happened. Deceiving yourself into thinking that these, I won't go so far as to say imbeciles know something about life when they don't. Start deconverting. But the original thing, yeah, Christianity might have been originally a gift in your life, but the, that fire is something that needs to be cultivated by you. A religious experience is partially subjective, period. There's no escaping that. There's no escaping that. That's reality. And if you don't want any part of it, that's your prerogative. But it isn't something like the weather that just happened to you. It's not. It's not Christianity, you know, it's raining outside. That's not how Christianity works. Christianity says it's raining somewhere, somehow, really importantly and, and clearly and beautifully. It's up to you to find it. That's more what Christianity is proposing. Not that it's raining outside and you just don't know it. Because that's what atheists act like Christianity is saying. It's raining outside. No, it ain't, Craig. <laughs> Reality check, it ain't. 
I was, I'm not saying that, and no Christian is. They're saying it's raining somewhere that you don't really know about. You're going to have to look long and hard to find it. It's worth your time to find. Why? Because it's beautiful. And you don't even know what, what, what time it is because you have no idea how good it actually is. That's more what Christianity is saying. A pearl of great price hidden in a field somewhere. Sell everything you have and find it. Why? Because it's worth it to you. That's what Christianity is saying. So, I think that was clear. Maybe not. Whatever. Doesn't really matter, kids. Why? Because there'll be a video tomorrow. It'll be even better than this one. How's it going to be better than this one, Craig? I don't know. I'm going to outdo myself. But we just heard everything. I know you did. <laughs> I'm aware of that. But tomorrow's video is going to be even better. Well, hallelujah, Craig. That sounds awesome. Yep. Yep. I agree. It does. That is all for now, kids. The Mass is ended. Go in peace. Amen.